This episode is brought to you by Rick's Eyewear. Eyewear that inspires confidence. If you would like to buy some premium eyewear, sunglasses, blue light frames, prescription, head online now, rickseyewear.com.au and check it out. Caps has been Australia's home of headwear since 2012. From snapback to fitted, curved peak to flat peak, our hats will fit anyone and everyone. Since then, we've grown and evolved into the leaders of US sports apparel in Australia. Head online at caps.com.au and check it out. Righto, let's get into the show. I know, Jakey, we're, uh, we're back in business. Before we start, big shout out to Kyle on last week's podcast. Um, heaps of positive feedback and some great learnings for everyone out there. Sole traders especially, Jakey Boyd. Mate, his business brain's something else, isn't he? The three pillars that enable the business, three pillars that make the business money. So definitely a good one for everyone starting out in business to get, a, get across his insights. The business doesn't stop. It's booming today. We're very lucky to have another guest. Um, I'm going to- Big guest. Big guest. Physically big, as well. Physically, mentally. <laughs> this bloke is an animal. Um, I'll give everyone an insight on who is here and then we'll welcome the great man. So, well, first of all, Sean, welcome to the podcast. Um, for everyone listening, Sean was one of the first LinkedIn employees in Australia and has been consulting to businesses, universities, and athletes with smart and simple LinkedIn coaching and strategy services for over seven years now. Um, as an independent consultant that has actually worked in LinkedIn, uh, Shawnee Boy over here utilizes factual insights and data to help you achieve greater success in your individual and collective endeavors via the platform. Working with athletes, students, and corporates, his broad background across psychology, talent management, LinkedIn, and elite sport really allows him to consult in a very practical and holistic manner. Beyond his LinkedIn experience, Jakey, Sean is an, also an ex-Olympic rower. Whoa, here ex we go. Ex-Olympic rower. There we is, go. Who is all about working with others to achieve mutual success. Sean, welcome to the platform. Thanks, Tony. Gee, Thanks, that Jake. was an intro, by the way, it's wasn't a fairly it? Fairly <laughs> in-depth intro. Yes, I mean, <laughs> is that the podcast? <laughs> that was outstanding. I haven't done one of them before because normally we get into it, but I just want to let everyone know that we have a great guest today and we there's do. plenty coming their way. I Mate, appreciate it. That's a pleasure, pleasure to meet you. Tommy's told me all about your uh, your background. I feel like, are we going to start with the rowing or are we going oh, to go through? We, we have to get into, I mean, to be an Olympian yes. is just incredible. To be, you know, to, to do the things you've done, everyone out there wants to, to hear about it. And then we'll talk about the transition into the real world um, and how that correlates. But mate, uh, sure. give us a little bit about your background and, you know, growing up. Yeah. Um, I was born in Sydney. I grew up in Brizzy. But my grandfather actually played for the doggies back in the day. And when I was 12, he taught me how to row, took my family out for a row and a four down on the Gold Coast and had a box. And I got sick of swimming in, in high school. I went to Brizzy Grammar and just thought, well, I'll take up rowing as a first time sport. It took me probably three months to learn how to go straight, fell in a few times. And then after that, I went all right. And um, yeah, ended up rowing for Australia for about eight years there. Yeah. Matt, that's incredible. For the, for the <laughs> listeners, anyone like me and Tommy, surely in PE class, everyone's tried to do the ergo machine. Now, I don't know if there's a technique or if it's a physical appearance that's better for rowing, <laughs> but some people, like I think I'm going quick and well, but some people are covering twice the distance at the same time. So what's the actual key to being a good rower? Uh, leverage. So it's all about um, making sure that the sequence is as smooth and connected as possible. Legs, body, arms, arms, body, legs, basically. That's exactly what Griffin Logue, my mate, told me <laughs> earlier. He's a, obviously an ex-roller uh, himself growing up. And he said the exact same thing. He actually went through the motion. Let's just quickly give the big fella a plug. Griff, as you're listening, I told him that we've got an animal on the show today that's better than him. <laughs> I've got one uh, one question before we get back into the um, the journey as, you know, how you got to become an Olympian. Your 2K ergo time. Yep. What is it? Uh, 554 was my best. Ah, oh, yes, you've got him covered. 554. That's quick. Uh, yeah, it's it's not uh, Are we too talking quick. 1K or 2K here? 2K, 2K, 2K <laughs> mate. You listen to the question, <laughs> brother. Goodness gracious. Uh, most of the boys these days do sub 550 and their world records, I think, like a 533 now. I must say, I'm going to give my mate a pump up here. Griffin Logue did a 610 at 16 years old. Yep. Does that mean that, that is there much improvement for him or does everyone do it at 16? Uh, I did a 606 when I was like 17. Yes. So you're yeah. probably better than him is what I want you to say. But, uh, <laughs> but, uh, but it's, 
I actually only found out recently the school rang me that uh, someone broke my record. I was like, I don't even know I had a record, but it had been 23 years. So if you're getting 6'10 or under as a schoolboy, yeah, you, you're going pretty well. Jeez, wow, that's impressive. So you went to the Sydney Olympics. No, no, I went to went Athens. 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 Yeah, so right. I blew my back out and, and missed out on Sydney, unfortunately. I had back surgery, so I was recovering. Wow, so yeah. you were a chance though. Uh, yeah, well, you, don't, you can't say you were in or not until you're in that actual year, but I was in the Australian team a couple of years before. Um, in 98, and then uh, yeah, I had back surgery after blowing my back out in, in training in WA. Hang on, let's go back before. How do you, you can't just get to the Olympics. How much work went into becoming an Olympian um, for this Athens campaign especially? And, and, and talk about that, that back injury. Like, what did you go through? Because that sounds like a real serious injury. Yeah, so essentially I finished school, went to the Australian Institute of Sport. You know, you, you leave a schoolboy rock star and you very quickly get told you and worked out you're not. And I was six years younger than anyone else. I had to grow up pretty quickly and you, you're doing 30 to 40 hours a week. It was one time, um, it just was post Christmas and my coach said, you know, get your, your cycling gear on and your bike ready. But we were heading towards Threadbow for a, a two week camp and this was in Canberra. I was like, why is he getting us to put this on so early? We got about 20 minutes out of Canberra. He goes, get out, you're riding. And we had to ride the rest of the way, like five hours. And I was still only 17. It's like, are you serious? And that was the start of the camp. You know, and two hours later, I, I've turned up, you know, purple and cold. And he's like, quick, have a shower, have something to eat. And then we're hiking across to Perisher. So it was, <sighs> it was full on. But that's the kind of mindset that you have to have a blend of endurance and then the speed and power uh, for it to work. That's so. incredible. Were you still in high school when you went to the Institute? Uh, just finished. Just yeah. finished. So you didn't have to go to school in Canberra? No, I literally went from school. He's like legitimately school. He's straight to, wow. to Canberra. Yeah. That's, that's pretty crazy because I think it's important for the listeners to go through this journey of the sport background because it enabled probably a lot of the business stuff. But Absolutely. what was some of the stuff you took out of being at the Australian Institute of Sport and preparing or fighting to, to get an Olympic spot? Uh, just to own. You have to own what you're doing and to simplify and focus in on what that is um, and work towards your weaknesses, not your strengths. So I was always like a strong, powerful, dynamic kid. So for me, it was endurance. Um, you know, cycling is something that I didn't really enjoy. I was always way out the back. Most cyclists are pretty, most rowers are rather pretty good cyclists. But it was focusing on the the weaknesses to get to where you wanted to get to um, and just tenacity. You've got to just continually strive, get up. You know, I was negative three uh, one morning in, in March in Canberra and I said to the coach, when are I going? How do I? He goes, get your gear off, get out there. Yeah. And you're like, your hands are purple, but that's the, the mindset, say, that when you're in a world of pain, you know, 1,500 metres into the 2K, you don't stop. You keep going, you keep pushing. Yeah. So at, at this time, because I think we spoke of uh, before we jumped on air, that rowing wasn't really a full-time career. Yeah. So back then, were you dabbling in like university or other sort of ventures in the business space to kind of keep you occupied? Yeah, I studied psychology. I originally wanted to do child psych. Um, and when I was rowing in Canberra, I worked with a company called Bernardo's who help integrate abused kids, like physically and sexually abused kids into foster homes. So I worked with a couple of boys and I did that for two years. Um, it's like a, a practical internship, if you like. Um, but then after that two-year period, Tom and Harley, I still remember the boys. They got put back with the biological father who was known to be the abuser. And for me, you know, if I didn't have rowing to turn up and tune off with, I soon realised that that was something I couldn't do long term because I couldn't just leave work at work. I got too emotionally involved. Um, yeah, but that was something to balance. And I'm also, there's two types of athletes there's those that are like the perfectionists and super detailed and that, and there's those that want to push the boundaries and test themselves in everything they do. I'm more this category. That has its pluses and minuses because <laughs> you can get, uh, you know, pretty wild in, in certain spaces. But for the point of that was I couldn't just be purely rowing. I had to have some other outlets, whether that be studying psych or working or doing other things. That's one thing I found with rowing, at, obviously, when I was at the AAS, it's, it's fascinating, Tommy, because um, cause I was underage at the time, we had to be in our, you know, the, the residence by before 10.30 p.m. You had to be in your room. Yep. And being a soccer boy that was like 15, 16, we're all little shits. And we used to get told <laughs> off by the house people that were minding us that you guys got to be quiet. And like, it's eight o'clock. And like, mm -hmm. yeah, but the rowers and swim, uh, swimmers are asleep. Yep. Because they'll be up at four or five training. Yeah, yeah. And they, they trained the hardest, and the gymnasts, the young girls, trained the hardest. At, like, they made us look like we had an easy life. Mm. So oh, the, the Jimmies outdo 
everyone. Yeah, they, you know, they, they eight hours a day. At least. And the poor things are on such strict diets. We used to like steal all these and walk Mm-mm. past them and just give them to them. They go, thanks. Yeah. Oh, really? Yeah, yeah. yeah, yeah. yeah. Like to eight, eight and nine-year-old girls doing eight-hour days. Like it's unbelievable. Yeah, if you need some motivation, yeah. That's crazy. There you go. Yeah, it's, it's a unique Let's talk place. about the training involved. Like give us a normal week. Um of training or even just a day. Yeah, sure. Rep- you, know, do you, you do probably, I'll go the week, you probably do seven sort of on water sessions, most are an hour to two hours. You know, you're doing 20 Ks minimum um, with workloads on top of that. Then you'd have a weight session, gym session three times a week. You do an ergo, you do uh, a running session where there's um, Black Mountain like Telstra Tower in Canberra. So your heart rate gets to about 180 after about two minutes and it just stays there for three and a half Ks up. And which is 12 and a half minutes, and then you back down and you do it again three times. That's just like a Thursday night. Another one, which was always a killer, was like an hour ago where you do seven minutes at a certain pace and seven minutes at a slightly lighter pace, but still pretty intense. And so you're just going up and down, up and down for an hour. And after that, I just used to get the bucket ready and, oh. and vomit. Um, yeah, so it's it's in total, you, yeah, you do 30, 30 hours a week. These days, they train professionally. So they'll do 40 hours at least and a cycle, you know, five hours, six hours cycle. Wow. Was yeah. the rig in just the best nick it's ever been in the world? Like this is serious. You'd have, if you're not looking good after that. Yeah, photogenic like, people. Yeah, 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 yeah. You had about 6% fat and could eat, <laughs> eat whatever you want. Oh yeah, that's God. the thing. You can literally eat what you want because you're burning so much. Yeah, yeah. With the gym sessions, though, I want to get a bit deeper into this. Gym's a term that we can all, I can go to the gym and say I went to gym, but yep. look at me, I'm a stick. <laughs> <laughs> what are you doing in the gym? Lower body, upper body, dynamic? Is it, like, is uh, it power? What is it? Uh, so to be generally uh, like strength power because you don't want to necessarily put on muscle, but you want to be as strong and as lean as you can. Um, you know, when I came from school, I was like 98 kilos, which is probably too heavy. So they just maybe do circuit work. So 70 reps, 70 um, repetitions of something. And as soon as my heart rate got below 120, go again. But most of the time it's strength. So you're doing between say three and eight reps. So you might do two, four, six, eight, six, four, two on on power cleans, deadlifts, squats, um, pulls, bench press, yeah, chin-ups. How many chin-ups could you do? Uh, yeah, we used to do like a rowing session, like an hour and a half, two hours, and then do as max you can this way and max that way. I used to get out about 25 that way and 20 that way after a rowing session. We might session. need to do like a little max rep challenge here just between the three of us just <laughs> to see how far off we are. Guess, <laughs> not guess, anymore, mate. <laughs> guess, guess what my record is on the chin-ups. Um, I'll go in one max. One max. Yeah, max uh, overhand though. I'll go 17. 25. That's yeah. massive. Yeah. But I, That's a I had big a, effort. I actually had a bet with the boys last year and I strained my rotator cuff. I was, try, I was trying to get 30. I had a bet with the boys. Do you reckon, what's the key do, with it? Is it do you is mean it, your lat, mate? Your rotator no, cuff? No, <laughs> no, no. I tore my rotator cuff. I swear to God, I thought I did my tricep off the bone. And I, in Cottesloe, like, I went for a run, pump out max, chin ups. I just did like six and then went tight and then I'm like fuck it I'll do it again and it was I this pre something. run and you were running with Post the shirt off a long no no no, no, no. The shirt, <laughs> the shirt going, hey, I'm, not, I'm not an Olympic rower mate <laughs> <laughs> nah shirt was on yeah it's uh, nasty so I haven't done one since but yeah good at the chin ups but the reason I asked you that was because some blokes that I know mm-hmm. in the gym that are really powerful were really poor at chin ups some of them were just yeah what's the is it, is it weight or is it like technique because you find some people who are smaller tend to do okay but even yeah well you've got to lift your body weight right so in the gym um it would you do chin-ups but with weights so you put on a weight yeah. belt and hang it down between your legs there so that gets you the strength um but it's it's just certain people can do it certain people can't um and if if you've got a lighter but higher power to weight ratio then yeah it's advantageous what was your best exercise uh, well, you kind of, I reckon you were, were you well-rounded? Yeah, yeah. Like I could squat 200 kilos three times. Jesus. Um, you know, when I was 18 and that <laughs> the lat pulls, I was always strong. Um, like the strengths, as I said earlier, was always sort of my asset, if you like. I was the shortest in the Australian team at, at 6'3", so there you go. Well, so, what was, so, so you're the shortest at 6'3". Yeah, yeah, yeah. In uh, in the Olympic year, yeah. Most rowers would be minimum sort of 6'4", six, 6'5", six, and, and then up from there, the tallest, like, say, Jimmy Tompkins, who was in Nelson Forsen, yeah, 6'7". Why does so, that, why does that, why is that an important factor? Uh, it's leverage. So, okay. if you've got, like, uh, the fork, a fork from, like, a strong core, the leverage you can hang off the handle connects to the oar gives you an easier rhythm and an easier stroke if you like so that height 
allows you to row far easier, but it's not always the determinant. There's a Victorian here, Peter Anthony, who's, you know, uh, 6'1", and they were, he and another guy, Steve Hawkins, were lightweights, so tiny little guys. They won the gold medal in the double in Barcelona, and there's a photo on the podium where they're like this, <laughs> holding the bronze and silver medalists on either side of them. That's insane. But they are the rarity. Yeah. Uh, you know, those two guys are the two most mentally tough people I've ever met. Yeah, that's incredible. Yeah. What's the, How hard, in obviously to be an Olympian is an amazing achievement, obviously, but how hard is it to be one of the few rowers, like how many people are vying for those spots to get selected just to get a view of? Yeah. So in the Olympics, you've got a sweep, which is like one or each. So there's the pair, the four and the eight. Um, so there you go. You've got um, 14 spots. And how many people like would, would miss out that are in contention for a seat? Like hundreds, like a couple? Uh, or is... Yeah. I mean, there's, I don't know how many people are rowing in Australia. There's, there's hundreds of thousands that go yeah. through from school. In the sculling, there's seven spots between a single, a double, and a quad. So in total, you've got you know, 21 spots in the men's team plus a, a coxswain. So it's pretty, pretty um, elite and, and challenging to get in there. Yeah, I guess. It's remarkable, mate, honestly. It's, yeah. I think for me, that I've always, and it was a shame because I've always planned with soccer, you can go to the Olympics as an under-23 comp, and Australia is usually quite successful, but it was always a bucket list, yep. and we didn't qualify. And I was always gutted because we were going to go to the, the Brazil Olympics, which more people probably would have come to watch the soccer than Absolutely. the track and field. But yeah, yeah, yeah. Uh, anywho, can for, for, for those like me and for everyone who, who's never been to Olympics, can you just tell us, like, I think it'd be remiss of us to not ask what it what it is actually like, like how yeah. unbelievable that experience is. Uh, it's pretty special, especially as an Australian. Like Australians love sport. So people that I don't even know you say go well and or thank you and it's, it's very humbling. But in the Olympics itself, rowing's in week one, so you get the best of everything. So you turn up, you deliver, win, lose, or draw, that's it. Um, and then week two, you get to go to the best parties, whatever sports you want. <laughs> you know, it was in Athens where I went, so there was like you know, Red Bull uh, parties where you walk in and there's personal chefs cooking there and there's free whatever, open bars and um, you know, you can go and watch the best sport in the world. Safe, so to, safe to say we'd be rocking up in week two. <laughs> <laughs> uh, yeah. Well, we wouldn't yeah, be yeah. there. <laughs> well, the Athletes Village, you know, there's 5,000 um, people in there. There was always like the abusive McDonald's posts who could eat 100 nuggets in 100 minutes, those kind of things. And, you know, obviously there's a lot of uh, elite athletes going around the pools and different things going on. Yeah, I've heard this. I've heard once they've finished, there's some totally yeah, athletes yeah, going around. It. Is it true that everyone just... Yeah, yeah, yeah. Like around the, everyone. Where you pick up your tickets, it's like fest. where you pick up condoms and different things as well. They yeah. literally hand out condoms. Is that true? Absolutely. Yeah. That's yeah. unbelievable. I've seen some of the beds though as well. They're, they're not they're not sustainable <laughs> for blokes like the rollers and <laughs> so forth. What are but they on the singles? Cardboard, cardboard boxes, mate. Gee, yeah. Yeah. I'm sure the rollers yeah. can throw a few mattresses together. <laughs> Got to get creative, I guess. <laughs> oh, yeah. um, that's that's crazy. Just yeah. a, a spin on business yep. um, on this aspect because usually when and I don't know what it was like back in 2004, but my assumption it would. Have been the same was there's obviously a lot of brands and um, yep. businesses and companies that want to work with you or have you represent them through that yeah. period. Was that a new experience for you? Did you have did you experience that? What was that like? Yeah, absolutely. Like we had our um, Australian kit because you're over in Europe uh, racing in the World Cups leading into it. Then when it came to the Olympics, you had to send all that home and you literally had there was like 600 items from a toothbrush to a full suit. Uh, that you just get your shopping trolley and you kit it out because it is all about branding and pe companies pay an enormous amount of money to ensure that during that period you're just wearing Nike or you're just drinking Powerade. Um, and so that's you know part of the deal, but it's you're very fortunate to, to literally get kitted out like that. Yeah, because yeah, I always see it's like a, a money pot for businesses, the Olympics. It's like who are the athletes that are probably going to pole yeah. position or even post-Olympics. Like they're the ones that yep. we know and all of a sudden all of, they're making this income from from stuff that, you know, they have nothing to do with prior to the events. Absolutely, and especially for rowing. Like most people wouldn't know and can't access rowing unless you go to private school. So the Olympics brings that to the fore. And thankfully Australia's had some reasonable success in, in rowing and those kind of things. But so business and sponsorship, it's a huge profile. The only... Uh, sort of sporting event that has a greater audience, you know, would be the Super Bowl or the Soccer World Cup. Yeah. But you put, you know, 20 different sports and more now into that one uh, environment and that's where the, the pressure comes from and that's where the opportunity comes and, and business want to be a part of that too. So how'd you go in the Olympics? Seventh. Yeah, Seventh. So a bit disappointing, but um, that's, that's what it is. You know, we won a World Cup prior to it, beat everybody and uh, probably you know, peaked a little bit early 
made a mistake in the heat and then in the semi it was like uh, and mm. not much in it so that's, it was disappointing from that perspective but you know you you move on and you're pretty content with everything I did achieve yeah, yeah. It's, it is. It's pretty pretty special. Was so up post the Olympics. Were you still rowing, or was this kind of you? You thought that was it? Uh, I got into it, and then my heart wasn't into it. So um, I sort of finished my psych degree. The mining boom was on, and someone said, "If you want to get yourself together, go over there and get into recruitment." So I moved to Perth and uh, got into recruitment and started rowing surf boats. So I rowed surf boats for North Cottesloe for four years, um, which was good fun. Yeah. On a bad spot, North Cot. <laughs> top spot, top spot. How long did you live in Perth for? Yeah, those four or five years. And um, yeah, then met my wife, my ex-wife over there and she's a Melbourneian. So we came across when we had our daughter. With your psychology background and probably yeah. the listeners will remember because it was quite a powerful moment um, just to go back to the 2004 Olympics with yeah. Sally Robbins, the rower. Yep. Obviously, I didn't really, I haven't watched too much rowing in my life, but I still remember that clear as day, that moment when, mm -hmm. I think, was it in a final? Yeah, it was in the, the final of the women's eight. Right. So she had a history of anxiety attacks and Correct. then she pretty much passed out in the boat. The yeah. girls obviously were pretty pissed off. They come seventh. Yeah, they come seventh and all the other girls kind of turned on her thinking like, well, she's just given up type thing. Yeah. From a psychology, well, as first as an athlete, what were your thoughts? And then from a psychology perspective, like how did you kind of look um, at that? No one wants to, you know, no one goes to the Olympics to finish second and no one wants to think that they didn't give their best or have the opportunity to give their best race. And that was the hardest thing for the other eight girls, you know, the seven rowers and the coxswain was the unknown of, of knowing that that race and that result didn't reflect what they were capable of. Um, but from a psych perspective and knowing Sally and had, having been in Australian teams with her, and she's a lovely girl. She's an amazing athlete. She was always one of the top two or three in the women's, but it was known for quite a few years leading into that, that she challenged and was challenged rather with the anxiety that came with the ultimate um, pressure in racing. So not even like a semi-final, but a world championship final or Olympic final. Um, she just never passed out before. And the selectors took the risk. They, they put her in the, in the eight because they wanted to, so to speak, stack, stack the eight with the best rowers. Um, and the girl in front of her on her like zoot suit, her rowing suit, had words and so forth that they would try and utilize for sell to calm herself. But wow. yeah, it's, you know, in my opinion, um, you, there's horses for courses and you're either cut out for it or, or you're not. And I think sales should have been put in you know, a single or something like that where it, it wouldn't affect anybody else if she did break down. Yeah. Um, and it was on the selectors and the coach that they, you know, took that risk and it, it obviously didn't work. They were expected to win that, weren't they? No, well, who knows? They could have, they they could have had a shot. Correct. They were in medal contention. Correct. They were okay. definitely in medal contention. Um, you know, you'll never know if they were able to win it, but they were certainly a good chance of getting a medal. Yeah. How how important, and obviously Tommy can talk to this because he obviously had a, a, a great footy career, but how important is the brain for performance in regards to from a footy player? Because obviously we look, oh, he's a great kick, he can move yeah, yeah. But it, a lot of it's played upstairs. Absolutely. It's huge. You hear endless stories about so-and-so's got potential. they got this. It means nothing. You can be the tallest guy with the biggest lungs or whatever, but you, you won't ever win a rowing race uh, or get to the top level unless you can apply it, unless you can apply it in the ultimate environment and handle that pressure, stay composed, stay relaxed and get the best out of yourself. So the mental side of things is absolutely paramount. When um, I made a mistake in a prelim back in, fuck, everyone knows the, about it. With Sur when Surioli just finished my career. <laughs> um, no, nah, like I, I was just didn't realise how much my, like it just rattled me. Like yeah. the next year, I was just copping it from fans and and you start listening. Yeah. And then it was, we were losing, like we were just getting punished. And um, and you just, like it just, I don't know, you just distract you. Like I'd be going into games and it might be even halfway through a game and you're like, fuck. I'm copying it. I've made two yep. mistakes now. The coach is now ripping me. All you're thinking about is mistakes. Where like when you're at your best, like which which you know you know what it's like. You're not thinking like that at all. You're actually playing free spirit. You you know what to do instinctually. You do crazy stuff. And you're like, how did I do that? Because you're not thinking. Mm. Um, and you do it on the training track as well. Like if you're under pressure, I used to find I did respond though. Like I when when challenged, but. Um, again, mentally, like you might be just flopping around and bang, fucking lift. And then you lift. It's like, again, probably wasn't at a hundred percent because you're, yeah. um, so it's amazing what it's you. Al it's also from a mental perspective, who you surround yourself with. Um, and a lot of 
like the awesome foursome boys got absolutely pumped in 88, the Olympics before and everything, but no one would know that. They weren't in the four, but they progressed from that and became stronger and better because, you know, Victorians got a phenomenal um, history in rowing and there was other people that they could turn to and, and get advice from. You know, the Olympics didn't work out for me. I always wish I had some better points of call to tap on the shoulder and learn from and then process that and understand that, you know, if you make a mistake, like you're talking about Tommy and, and those kind of things, that it's not the end and, and how you can move through that. Um, and that's one of the biggest challenges in sport or business is learning from things when they don't work out and when it doesn't go right um, to how you can move forward. And I think a lot of it has got to come from you, but then it's also having the network and circle around you that you can leverage and bounce ideas off. Just on that, let's let's dive into that. Let's say someone is out there that's that's struggling mentally it's all good. What if they don't have any connections out there? Like what are the steps that they can do to get back into a good shape mentally? Um, well, first of all, you'd try and if they don't have the networks, just try and seek support of, of some kind, depending on the level, you know, if it's counseling or if it's seeking a psychologist or, or something like that, just reach out and have a conversation. Um, if you've got, you know, if you've got a mate or someone to talk, talk's the biggest thing. And mm -hmm not being afraid to talk, I think, and that's shifted a lot and opening up about those uh, conversations and what's on your mind and, and then airing it um, to then identify, okay, how we can work that through. Do you find, and just this is a business twist on it, do you find like vulnerability and transparency in business is a really powerful trait? Like when people are very sort of, even if it's not, the, it's a hard truth or. Yeah, just being real. I mean, vulnerability is the big buzzword. It was agility before that. Now it's vulnerability. <laughs> um, but I Terminology, think, man, it kills yeah. me. <laughs> <laughs> uh, like COVID was pivot. You know, yeah. Now. yeah. Oh God, pivot. This, yeah, pivot but it's, it, to your point, it's, I, I think it's about being real. It's about being authentic. Just like you guys, who you are on this podcast and so forth in business and especially from leadership, people crave transparency. Now, that doesn't mean you need to air all your dirty laundry at work. You know, people don't need to understand that. And it may not, it might be career limiting if you do, <laughs> depending on what, who you are, what you've done. But I think it's about just being real and um, authentic and approachable, not that, not trying to portray that you're invincible, uh, that others can turn to you and have a conversation and work with that. And also you're showing your real self in the workplace. Um, that leads to... And deeper conversations, better output, and and therefore you'll get greater success in what you're doing. Was your stock after the Olympics from a business perspective where everyone, because I, I assume they're not like, oh, what did you study at uni? Like, I was an Olympian, he'll figure it out type thing. Yep. Did you get a lot of opportunities? Or was it easy to get a job post the Olympics for yeah. that reason? Yeah, like the Olympics uh, can change your life. It opens a lot of doors. The, I, the reason I got hired for LinkedIn was through networks and so forth, but I didn't even know how they monetized things. And I did, you know, it was just on LinkedIn, but they saw the, what a, Olympian and the characteristics an Olympian represents, you know, the discipline, the integrity, the competitiveness, the drive to achieve and just go, 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 which is what they wanted. If you were starting off in essentially a sales role for LinkedIn in Australia, it's like, you got to go tell the world what it is. Um, then you're going to get knockbacks, you're going to get no's. And so that Olympics element certainly opened doors and it continues to open doors for me. My, my current role with the winning group came from, uh, my boss now approaching me because we had similar sporting networks, not my career per se, although then obviously you have to be able to do what you need to do. And that came into it. But the first was because we, he respected mutual connections that I had, um, through sport and Australian sport and Olympics. Did One he of, reach out via LinkedIn? Did. 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 Oh, oh, LinkedIn. That's a good segue, Tommy. Yeah. <laughs> he did. Yeah. That's there you go. And that's why we're going to dive deep into a little bit of LinkedIn and, and everything else. But, what is it that people should be, you know, how should people be using their LinkedIn to maximize opportunity? Um, it depends on what your endeavor are, endeavors are rather. There's six times more people use it for sales than recruiting. Recruiting was just the easiest way to initially think about it. Oh, if I've got to get a job now, I'll just jump on this thing called LinkedIn. But it's access to um, an audience and leveraging relationships. There's, you know, 700 million people on there. There's 12 million in Australia on there. But it's, so what it does effectively is if you've got your network and your address, um, contacts in your phone and so forth, LinkedIn will serve up the next layer of who they know. 
So essentially allows you to far more effectively identify the people you can turn to, to get an introduction to someone else, whether that be for a job, whether that be to promote a product, whether that be to drive business opportunity, investment, partnerships, mentoring, anything. It's just taking the concept of who you know and allowing technology to help you identify that far more efficiently and effectively and then leverage trusted referrals to, to have those conversations and take it offline. One thing you spoke of before, and, and I reckon he's one of the best in the bloody country at it, is, <laughs> is networking. Yeah. And obviously for, for some people and some of our listeners that are probably doing jobs that they either A, enjoy or they want to move on to something else or yep. they want to actually do something they want to do. Is LinkedIn a good tool to network? Because as you said, you got your first job more from a networking basis as opposed to a CV. Yeah, um, absolutely. It's a, that's the essence. The essence is creating a profile or building a sphere of connections, if you like, um, that allow you to network more effectively with the right people. Yeah. What's you, the, I was going to say, like, oh, I'm self-employed at the moment with this, but unemployed essentially, uh, <laughs> working it out. And I've spoken to you about this, but you do help people with the transition from elite sport and yep. something that I'll be honest, it's been really tough. I've been lucky enough that I've got my own sunglass brand. Um, now I'm doing this full time, yep. but at some point once I've traveled and come back and worked out what I want to do, um, I'm going to start putting myself out there. Well, for anyone out there that's in a similar boat that hasn't got a job that, um, it, what's the easiest way to transition, I guess, from not only just sport, but also into another job through LinkedIn? Um, well, first and foremost is working out what it is you want to do. And you may not have the answer to that. So then it's about going, well, what do you really enjoy doing? What are those skills? What's the environment? And keep it high level. Don't think a job title or a role or business, but I love working with people. I love solving people problems, helping them achieve the outcomes thereafter. So, like, okay, do you like doing that in a, a larger group environment? Do you like doing that individually? And once you work that through and identify what's important to you and what you really enjoy and are motivated to do, then it's about putting that together and telling that story in a LinkedIn profile. Um, the hubs, the first part, it's, you know, the key part is telling your story effectively and in a real and authentic way that we were talking about before um, through your LinkedIn profile. Once you get that right, then you can start to use it as a, a, a search tool, research tool, searching for people, searching for companies, searching for information um, that can help you bridge those gaps, learn the skills or have introductions. So once you've got that foundation set though, yep. then what's the next move? Like you, you're saying, just reach out and say, hey, this is who I am. This is what I'm interested in. Is, no, there, no, is no. there an opportunity? No. So you get your profile right and you have the key words in there. So the algorithms of LinkedIn will pick up you in the right searches by others. So people recruiting might be searching for certain people, businesses might be searching. But for the to point, once you get the hub right, then it's about two things, either building your brand, showcasing what you're interested in through effective marketing strategies, posts, likes, comments that then allow others to see and say, ah, you know, Tommy's got skills in ABC, he's interested in this. And then human curiosity goes, well, who's Tommy? I'm going to click on his profile and I look at that and it goes, ah, I know Jake that knows Tommy. I'm going to reach out and can you introduce me? And so the brand awareness piece through sharing and commenting creates interest in you. The other side of it is looking at potentially who you know on LinkedIn. So go to where you're comfortable and, and that's your you know phone contacts. Search them up, see where they work, see what they do and connect with them and then have conversations. And then it's about leverage, leveraging them for an introduction to a business, an individual or an opportunity that you, you don't necessarily feel confident to reach out to them directly. And, you know, there's so many people hitting up people all day, every day. You'll, you rarely will get a response if you just hit up someone coldly. Like even the best salespeople might get a 32, 33% response rate. But if you leverage a mutual relationship for an introduction, you get, you know, 70, 72% responses because it's, I can then pick up the phone and say, hey, Tommy, do you know this Jake guy? Is he, he's, he's reached out to me on, on LinkedIn. Is, is that okay? You know, he's a good guy. He wants to talk about this. Oh, yeah, 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 he's good. And so you you aren't confronted like a telemarketer is, is on the phone to you. <laughs> You've got the time to look and see who it is. You can then work out who you, who you know that knows them and then empower to say, all right, I'll respond to you and come back. That's and, fascinating. Yeah, it is. It's the second layer. And then, I mean, how many times – I'm still thinking – if you want to land a job though, like what yep. if nothing happens? Like what if no one really, you, you're saying most people will get a job through that process? 
Well, it depends. You At the moment, um, it's a candidate's market, which means that there is more jobs than there is quality people in the country because you've had <coughs> COVID and two years of closed borders. Um, so you can apply, but it's from a, if you look at a recruiter's perspective or a business, I can sift through 100 applicants and it'll take me two weeks or two days or whatever, or I can jump on LinkedIn, proactively search for the people that I think match the skills I'm looking after, do my front-end reconnaissance to say, who do I know that knows them, and then identify a list of like three to five. It's far more effective. I'm using trusted relationships to pick that other, are they the right people for me, but not just for me. Um, and it's not just about can, can they do the job, but culture fit and motivation uh, lead to success and performance. So if you're on the, to answer your question, if you're on the, the job hunt side, it's a key avenue to build quality relationships that you make the right choice about not just taking a job, but working somewhere that's going to motivate you to turn up every day. Can I um, create a bit of role play here, Tommy? But if you're <laughs> if you're a, a young male or female between yep. 20 and 30 and you may be doing, let's say, a retail job, yep. that year is a bit of a pathway to before you get into something you want to do. Mm -hmm. If there's a specific company that you want to work for, you've always thought you want to work for or a person you want to work for, yep. what would be your strategy if you were that person to create networks, to create connections, to maybe get a, a foot in the door? Well, firstly, follow the company. Yep. So search them up on LinkedIn and follow them. As soon as you follow them, you'll get sent updates of what they're doing, what they're up to, jobs, but also who's working there. And so you may not know anybody that works there now, but then as you build your networks and so forth, all of a sudden it'll tell you, LinkedIn will spoon feed you that Sean now works at Winning Group. If you want to get a job in retail marketing, you can reach out to Sean. And that's where you can start to build relationships. But then the second part is, if you're that young male or female trying to work out, you want to move into finance or you want to move into marketing or you want to move into sales, is what's the skills I've got now and the gap between the skills I need to do that job. And so you can do your research to look at the skills in the job ads or that on people's profiles and say, Sean started here and then his career went here, here, here and now he's head of marketing, I'm not, but you know, head of marketing mm. at company ABC. <coughs> And so you uh, can have effect, more effectively make decisions based on seeing the pathways of others as well as um, relationships and understanding a, an organisation. Oh. Does that make sense? Yeah, yeah, yeah it makes yeah, perfect it's sense. It's good. it's good for everyone out there. Great role play, great question. Well, thank you, guys. <laughs> um, <laughs> let's talk about school. How important is school and university degrees in modern uh, day world? Oh, question. sure. Oh, just want, to, just want to caveat no, no, this. No, give an insight on the, the, the school <laughs> stories. Mate. Let me ask right, the question no, okay, first. Okay. Uh, <laughs> I've got two kids, one at high school right now. So education is important in terms of having the – the knowledge um, and acumen, but it's not the be-all, end-all, and like the top 10 most in-demand jobs at the moment are tech jobs. Um, and you don't learn that at school, although some schools, they're doing code at an early age. But the other key element that's probably underrated is because of all the technology improvements and dig digitalization, you still need someone to have the people skills to interpret it, to be able to talk, to be able to present, to be able to bring people together. Um, and that I think is, whilst it's not a direct result of science or math or English, that education, um, gives you the well-rounded, uh, opportunity and potentially you, you might be speaking at school, you might be involved in sport and that confidence, um, leads to that later life capability. Just to click one further on that before you probably <laughs> reel into some of your history, but, um, that next phase, obviously you've got a, a son you mentioned in high school. Yeah. So sort of that 18 to 19 period, everyone's in that sort of bracket of they're still not sure what they want to do, but you've almost got to make this, you know, decision that's going to create debt to essentially enable a future by going to university and picking a course. Yep. How important do you think universities, obviously there's some industries you can't avoid it, like being a lawyer or a doctor. Correct. But in general, like for some people, are you seeing that sort of the trend of having a degree is diminishing a little bit or is it still really important? Um, I uh, how do I say this effectively? He's on the record here, so he's <laughs> thinking. <laughs> no, no, no. Like I've got a like I used to mentor and, and work with MBA students at Melbourne Business School for a little while, and the MBA was the sort of you know ducks nuts uh, 15, 20 years ago. Now it's all about micro credentials. Go and do a short course, upskill yourself in this and that, get 
six weeks at Harvard. So you got the Harvard brand on your profile and those kind of things. So the long degree, less so, unless you are, you know, an engineer, a lawyer, Lawyers, an accountant, yeah. a doctor, we've got to have the specific qualifications. It depends what you want to do. Um, tradies and huge money. Construction, property development. What's important to you? Like, is it money? Is it uh, helping people? So it's not a, a be all end all to go to an elite school and go to university. Okay. So they can do, so you can kind of fast track by doing these short courses in specific fields. Yeah. To then fall into that field, I guess, for a job. Correct. There you go. That's great insight, and that's very good. That's what I've been saying all my life. <laughs> the, the, the biggest thing as well is that's been shifting so rapidly these days is it's more about if you're a good person that suits our team and our company and you're motivated by who we are and the way we work, we'll teach you the skills. Mm. You know, I've got someone in my team at the moment who's a young guy with a, a great aptitude to develop and we need a social media uh, content creating person. He's shown an interest in that. So it's like, well, we'll pay for you to go and do a social media digital marketing course and bring you up to speed rather than recruiting somebody in who's already got that because you're a part of our team and a part of our culture that works really well. And you like the values he lives and, and all that kind of stuff. You want to keep them involved. Yeah, absolutely. You want to help develop and reward those people who want to work within your organization. Um, I mean, they can go through endless studies, but essentially – that culture fit and motivation. So are they the right person for you? And are they doing something that they're motivated by? Has lead led to high performance and tenure more than anything else. Whereas it used to be match your resume to the job. Great. You can do it. But if I don't, 80% of people leave jobs because of the manager. So if they piss me off and I'm not motivated to do what I'm doing, I'm not going to stay. Mm. What were some, what's, what are some, and Tommy, this is also a question for you. What are some really important leadership qualities you think for, for, you know, senior executives or, or managers that you report to that you find really bring the best out in people? It's the base, basics, really. People just like to be acknowledged. Listening, having a one-on-one -on, -one on a monthly basis and the one-on-one -on -one not just talking about your KPIs or your data or your metrics, but how you're going and what's important to you. There's the biggest things that people want in the workplace these days are flexibility, so flexible hours, flexibility with remote office, home, or managing life, kids. And the second one is a sense of development. So if you are someone that is actually there to help develop your team, listening and, and not what you can do for me, but seeing you motivated and happy, then I think that's a better leadership quality in business than potentially the traditional one, which is, no, you're turning up to do a job. <laughs> you know, I've worked for 12 years to become partner of such and such consulting firm. You're going to do your and your stripes too. Sounds like day one of walking into an AFL club. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, clean, well, the, clean the boots, Rook. I can. Oh, you don't clean the boots, but uh, you definitely can't be late to meetings like oh. school. So oh, you, yeah. you learn the hard, boots in the soccer world. You learn oh, the hard way. Uh, my work ethic is important. Don't don't underestimate that. You know, you don't get anything without some effort and, and hard work. But to your question around leadership, I think it's more about um, don't pigeonhole people because um, you won't keep them even if they're a high performer. Mm. Uh, look at developing and cross internal mobility. So taking people from different areas, uh, different business units, and get, that's an opportunity to develop and expose and more broader multi-skilled staff and workforces is advantageous. There's a lot of great statistics around um, athletes or professional athletes yep. transitioning to the business space that become high performers because yep. um, of some of those fundamental fundamental traits you touched on. Yeah. What what would it what would be some of the things that you felt essentially enabled you to be really good in business quickly after um you hung up the, the all? Yeah. yeah, yeah. <laughs> um the the discipline to just get it done. Uh get involved and and not be afraid of hard work. The other part is the um integrity to say you're gonna do what you say you're gonna do. And um being solution orientated, continually seeking for like the problem is in the end point. It, it, there's a way around it and working through that and being consultative, being resourceful. You know, if you want that goal of getting to the Olympics, you're not going to get put off by a little bump in the road. Um, and that's the same mindset you bring to the workplace is solution orientated, consultative, working through something and then finding a way forward um, and getting the resources to do that. If you don't have them, seek them, find them you know, hire them or develop them. And that's uh, something that resourcefulness 
is something that you can take from sport and bring across. And the other part is working as a team. You know, rowing essentially is like that. If I was in a four, I'm only 25% of that output. And we, when we came together um, as an Australian team, you were the previous six months, you'd just been racing against each other. You know, different personalities. You know, I used to row with some guys that were just wacky as, and they would tell all these jokes and other guys before the race would be like really serious. But you've got to say, right, their strengths are this, my strengths are this. Let's work and I'm going to leverage them here and I'm, they're going to draw from me there. And that sort of um, connection and teamwork in business goes a long way. Yeah, you're spot on. It's definitely about the team. You see, I mean, footy's different not to, to rowing. There's more people in the room. So you do see all these different, you know, originally you kind of say, oh, geez, he's a weirdo. But then you love weird by the end of it. Like you want <laughs> you to embrace, you, you embrace it. You're like, that's actually great. I didn't think like that. It changes the way you think. So you're spot on. I can see how there is a correlation um, so that's between a really good that. point, Tommy. Like it's not about having the cookie cutter version of you in mini me's and that a good leader is comfortable in themselves to not have to be all things to all people, but I need this and that. Like my boss hired me because he's an ex teacher. So he's like, right, I actually need someone who understands brand, you know, LinkedIn succession planning, development, recruiting, because I don't know what best practice is. Mm. And he's not threatened by that. He's gone, no, he actively went out and sourced it because that's what I need in the team. And, you know, we bounce ideas and he asked for my advice. So that's, that's what good leadership is as opposed to you know, certain leaders, which is like, no, you got to do it my way. And, and I think that's a little bit, um, you know, in the past. One thing we always ask on um, Aces in Business is, it, I mean, I'm an audio book man and Jake's a, he likes to read books, but is there any books out there that you've read? Anything is this back that, to the going to school? We got it. No, we got it. We had an outrageous answer last week. Well, Kyle trainer, so yeah, we did actually. We yeah. had Kyle reckons that he's, he can read a, a book and then <laughs> listen to a, another book on audio at the same time, which is. Okay. Uh, uh, was he, Braden, did he mean the same book? Read no. audio of the same yes. book? He wasn't different books. It was the same. Oh, was it? So yeah, but he was. Read it and listen to it at the same time. Oh, the, the, I misinterpreted it. Yeah, the same book. No wonder I was blown but away. Even, no, but even, <laughs> even so, I I'm sitting there going, how the fuck yeah, are you doing he that? Said, what, why, how the fuck do you do you that? I said that on the show and he goes, yeah. <laughs> no, but I think, I think the way he, what he's talking, I think what you're saying probably mm. makes more sense interpreting that way to read to read an audio of the same book doesn't make any sense to me oh, if it was it, different i would think it does oh, to well, me i reckon yeah, reading and listening just, makes sense now it makes sense oh, i didn't oh gee whiz there you, there go. you go anyway sorry that's the question though yeah. is there a book that you've applied your life and your principles to in business or is there anything that's yeah yeah um gridiron genius by michael lombardi michael was the recruiter for some of the most successful nfl teams through the 80s and 90s and some of the best coaches, and that book is phenomenal. That can be a direct correlation to um, workplace behaviours. Culture was the biggest thing, and they picked. You know, it was a bit like um, what's that movie, Money, Money, Money Ball? Ball? Yeah, 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 yeah. That was the principles that they applied. Was I need this person to do this role, and that was sort of the first pioneers of that back in the eighties. And and but the principles and they created like these 17 standard of performance that were non-negotiable behaviors for anybody from the front receptionist to the head coach. And if you didn't follow that, you're out. And they, you know, had enormous success by, it created a sense of belonging, it created a sense of excellence uh, and identity above and beyond just the jersey you wore and those kind of things. And they were non-negotiables of how you treated people. When you look at the All Blacks, the rugby team, they have the similar sort of behaviors and standards you know you clean the sheds after games someone else doesn't clean up for you so there's that book um great on genius that's Fantastic. right in your sweet spot yeah he uh, loves NFL. Lombardi that's what it, that's what you want to hold up at the end of the year <laughs> <laughs> that's, yeah. yeah that's cool that's really impressive well, yeah and he's got a good way out. of doing it um Mike Lombardi of turning elite sport into everyday terms that a layman can use can you give us a little bit of like what's the one thing out of that book that you can remember um, was there like a principle, anything that you, even in the culture side of things, you said like how important culture is. Was there one thing that you can remember? You've got to have, um, what are the six things that you stand for in an organization? So I was at an organization, I won't say who that is, but they literally asked to come in. I said, what does it mean to be a so-and-so? And they go, what do you mean? So what does it mean to, to work here? And they go, well, you just do your job. <laughs> you know, you got to do this, got to sell that, et cetera. It's like, no, no you got to have a sense of identity because I had an issue with retention. 
you know, they couldn't keep staff. And it's like, well, they don't really value. They're just turning up, getting their paycheck. And if someone down the road offers them a dollar more, they're going to go. Yeah. So it's like, what do we want to stand for? And literally write that out, then agree to it. And then it's got to come from the top. The leadership have to walk the walk on it. It's not like these are our values and buzzwords that are all over your walls and, and in the paraphernalia that you use, they need to be actual behaviors that leadership exhibit first and foremost, then others will follow underneath. That's becoming paramount now for big corporations yeah. to lure people to yep. their company and maintain them. You're spot on. Um, one thing we always ask around on Aces in Business for, and obviously someone like yourself would have probably worked with a lot, but is around mentorship. Yep. Um, so A, did you do you have a mentor, in, particularly in business? And B, what's, what's the best piece of advice you've been given to assist you? Um, I've got a few different people that I sort of turn to uh, from a business perspective, it's sometimes uh, colleagues, it's sometimes people I've worked with. From a personal perspective, you know, I reach out to guys like Drew Ginn, who was in the Awesome Foursome, um, a lot, and we get along sort of, you know, as mates and that as well. But his sort of, his way of thinking uh, is, he'll he'll always say, why, why not? Um, you know, like, there just because it hasn't been done before, it doesn't mean it, it can be. And that a challenge you know, so well have you thought about this have you thought about that and why why wouldn't you explore this so if i'm working through should i take this opportunity or should we pursue this or how can we do things differently it's good to have that mentor that i can sort of bounce ideas around and they will challenge you so you like a mentor shouldn't just be someone that's uh you know absorbing what your frustrations are or who you can vent with but they can challenge you to say well, why why would you do that? Why are you putting up with that? Or why wouldn't you go for this or, or think differently and apply that? And I think that's a critical role um, that everybody should surround themselves with. And something that I do from the consulting perspective is when you're talking about athletes leaving their environment, you know, in your footy environment, um, you've got dietitians, you've got umpteen coaches, you've got someone telling you what to do, what to wear, <laughs> where to be 24-7. And then when all that's pulled back, you okay. And I struggled with it when I left elite sport and I turned up to work, you know, you're used to getting feedback, whether it's good or bad, two times, three times a day. You yeah. turn up to work and it's like, here, mate, this is what we need to do. And it's like, oh, I just did this. Is, yeah. is this good? It's like, yeah, whatever. There's, there isn't that acknowledgement. There isn't that. That's what of, you're probably experienced probably more recently. Well, that's than, what than I struggle with now. Like I'm still yeah. going through that transition. That's why when we linked up, it's different, man. Like, and I was the energizer bunny. Like I'd get up and, <laughs> man, you wanted to be acknowledged. I acknowledge 50 guys a day. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Women. Like, I'd be like, geez, you look good. Oh, how good's that? But you don't have that. And that's, that's one of the hardest yeah. things about transitioning. Um, and that's why we first met. I was like, mate, I'm fucking, I need some more people in my life, you know, like yeah. just and to be around. It. And that's part of, you know, the piece is whilst you're still playing before it all goes pear shaped for whatever reason, um, start to build that network back to what we were talking about earlier of people that you can tap on. It might be a mentor that you can bounce ideas around. It might be a finance person. It might be someone um, in business or, you know, to the mental health side of things that we were talking about, someone that you can confide in um, when you, you've got some challenges and we all have challenges. Yeah. yeah. Well said. It is great. Thank you for um, sharing that. We have a few hard-hitting questions and some great questions. Uh, before we go to there, I'm going to go to the caps moment. Um, we'll grab that black cap there, uh, Jakey boy. Throw that on if you want. But this is, uh, you know, big shout out to Caps, a huge sponsor caps of our save, show. Bro. They're and, um, superstars. Okay. And uh, obviously all our listeners, there's a discount code there on the house. Aces, you know the yeah. drill. Um, but this is a question oh, that we've thoroughly right enjoyed. Right. Yeah, you don't have to put it on. We don't want to mess the hair up, mate. Um, <laughs> you're right, you're right. Probably got a meeting later. Look at the big head. Oh, <laughs> she has the XL. Um, but the Caps moment, the greatest moment in your business career and sporting career um, combined. So one moment that stands out for you that changed your life. Business and sporting combined, or yeah. So if I said one moment, what's the greatest moment? I mean, Olympics is probably one, so maybe separate from that. Yeah, yeah. Um, well, there'd be two. So in the sporting side of things, winning the World Cup in the Olympic year that, against the best of the best, and it was also just a, a perfect race. Like it was in Lucerne, which is in Switzerland, and um, so the course itself is like a public accessed lake. So down at the start, you've got kids swimming and going down a slippery slide and on the hills here is all the cows and the bells going ding, ding, ding. And it absolutely pissed down before the start. So you're sitting there and it's like freezing and that. But for us, that just relaxed you. 
and I was really calm because we were like having a laugh. You know, you're actually drenched and it's cold. And but say for the Germans who were the world champs, they were rattled. Yeah. And it was just the most perfect, seamless race um, that in the home of rowing where the first world championships were. And that's something I'll always treasure. Is that the next pinnacle after the gold medal? Or is that even seen as higher a World Cup? Like, oh, uh, no, that that's below, below Olympics okay. gold medal and that. Yeah. But yeah. That's that's, awesome. that's, that's insane. It. That is yeah. the caps moment. Yeah, yeah. The, the Germans rattled. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> just in the, in well, the rain. <laughs> there you go. Next time the Olympics is on and it starts raining, I'm going to put my money off the Germans, mate. Line up. Get on dabble. Get off the Germans. <laughs> get on dabble. Line <laughs> up against um, Germany. <laughs> in, a, in a business sense, it was yeah, going out of my own. When I was at LinkedIn, that was you know a phenomenal experience and changed the trajectory of my career and, and life. Um, you know, take opportunities when they're presented and. Um, after two and a half years, you know, I was consulting and I had, I think I told you this story, Tommy, I had group digital directors, you know, pretty senior people at big companies saying, you've got this $50,000 product solution in front of us. He goes, Sean, I don't know what the fuck it does. <laughs> and so that sort of triggered in me, it's like, oh, there might be something in this. People just want to know how to use the platform first. What do I do with my profile? What does it mean for me? And all the stuff you can do for free and how does it actually work before I'll go and buy the products? The products work and, you know, it's, they're certainly very successful as a result of it. But that flowed on to me testing the water through my networks. And it's like, if I did this, you know, would you pay for it? And they go, yeah, I would. If you can come and, you know, run a workshop or run some one-on-one or work with our execs, execs and so forth. So leaving LinkedIn when we were renovating a house and had a daughter, um, still have a daughter, but obviously a young daughter, mm. um, that was a big risk, but something I was really proud of and something that I, you know, um, glad I did. And that ability to follow what was important to me, which was not selling products to people that don't want it. Um, I'm not very good at just sort of pulling the wool over people's eyes, but actually going out and help people. And it's, it's what I love now. It's really tangible. Solving people problems and seeing them getting that direction and purpose, whether they're an individual, whether they're a group, whether they're an athlete, that's what I thrive on and that allowed me to do it. So taking the leap to become an independent consultant, as scary as it was, and you haven't got the paycheck guaranteed every month um, initially until you, you get things going. Yeah. It's, yeah. it's, it's amazing. It is amazing. And it's important that we uh, let everyone know how to get in contact with you because um, you are consulting still, yep. obviously, yep. on your own and uh, you, you know, you're very good at what you do. So how can we'll put it in the show notes for everyone listening and watching. This will be in the show notes. So hit the description. But yeah, where, do, where does everyone head to uh, contact you? Yes, yeah, so you can go to colden.com.au or you can connect with me on LinkedIn. Um, yeah, Sean Colton just practice what I preach, reach out to me. I was me. about to say, yeah, it has to be the LinkedIn. <laughs> Pretty dumb question, wasn't yeah, it? Yeah, <laughs> I mean, where else? <laughs> yeah, there is obviously, I, I assume you're sharing like my email and those kind of things, that's fine as well, but yeah, jump on nah, LinkedIn. We'll, and chuck with the LinkedIn me. we'll chuck the LinkedIn link in the uh, description and, and we go from there. Right, oh, chuck me those uh, those Rick Sunnies there, Jakey boy. I think the Calvins I've selected. This is a, Hopefully another, they another big question here for um, you, The Sean. other ones there. But uh, right. uh, Rick's in retirement, another segment, um, a little gift here from Rick's Eyewear, mate. So if Very you good. are in need of prescription, we do do them as well. So send them back They're my the way. The founder of these is pretty good bloke. Yeah, yeah. 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 Cohen's a good yeah, bloke. Yeah, Cohen's a ripper. You beat me to it. I know, I bet you I'm quick. Um, Rick's in retirement. So yep. once you've made a killing in life and you can settle, yep. where's the one place in the world? And I'm looking forward to listening to this because he's been everywhere in the yes. world. Where's the one place in the world you'd love to throw the sunnies on and retire? Ooh, retire. Uh, retired be south of France, but yeah, where I, I mean, I've spent a lot of time in Switzerland and Italy and uh, Florence is probably my favorite place in Italy, but still sort of south of France is pretty hard to beat. But right now, I'd love to go to Montenegro and Slovenia. Beautiful. I was about to say yeah. a man of acquired taste, and then he's yeah. Slovenia and Montenegro. What are that? What are, what are they like? I don't think I've ever been. Um, well, Slovenia is like Prague, but you know, it's less. Um, it's less sort of appealing at the moment. It's like you know, you had the Greek islands, and then everyone wanted to go to Croatia. Slovenia is obviously around there and just as beautiful, but it's probably less well known. Okay. And Montenegro is in the same spot. 
Yeah, beautiful. That's yeah. great. Well, there you yeah. go. Rick's in retirement. Just on that, I want to keep talking about travel because it's a great before we wrap this up. But you've been all over the world. Yeah. What are the, what's one of the coolest stories you've got for us while you're on tour with the boys? Is there any places uh, you went out? Any <laughs> weird countries you've been yeah, to? Yeah, absolutely. He's trying to limit down to PG and below. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, yeah. yeah, 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 right. <laughs> yeah, <laughs> yeah I'm giving him time to think yeah, right yeah, now. Yeah, you know, just like, dragged the question like, out. Like, a privilege. Like in Munich, we'd have you know personal chefs cooking for us in the beer gardens and we were training and you just had thousands of people going there and that was amazing um then in haswinkle in in belgium you know they're famous for their chocolate and beer and there's a thousand different beers and every beer has its own uh cup that goes within a glass um those kind of stories are, are amazing places obviously it's the standard you know amsterdam and that kind of stuff which is always good fun and um but yeah they would be Two of my favourites, living in Switzerland where you're, you're rowing during the day and then you, you're up on the mountains and there's still snow there and you're able to ski. They're incredible experiences. They are. That sounds incredible. It's, mate, oh, are, we, are we still running with this uh, next guest segment? Because we, uh, we keep pushing it, but we haven't landed one yet. We're, yeah, we're going we're gonna to ask the question. We're going to ask the question. Now, Sean, we do have a regular question. It's one of our sort of rounding up questions of the show. Okay. And we probed it to every guest because we are a relatively new platform. Obviously, Oz American Ace has been around for a little bit longer. Mm-hmm, but mm-hmm. from a business perspective and for our listeners, who do you think would be a good guest from your network or that you know um, for our show, Aces in Business? Um, probably my, uh, current boss and founder, John Winning. Oh, that, that sounds achievable and attainable. <laughs> <laughs> I've heard he's, he's a good bloke and, uh, I reckon we might be able to land our first Oh referral. my God. You could be the first, cause we've had referrals, he's, but we haven't had the, fo- the crunch follow up. Yeah. I mean, he's a fourth generation, um, family sort of business person, but he was 21 and uh, I don't know if you know the story, but winning appliances, so they sell appliance goods, homes goods, but luxury. And he was 21 and he's gone, dad, you know, I think I might throw one of your fridges up online. And he got a $50,000 business loan, put a fridge up online. That's now appliances online, which is like, you know, 200, 250 million on its own. So, oh, there we go. That's what we're talking you know, about. That's yeah. he's like Silicon Valley and totally disrupted that whole that whole space. You generally go one generation makes it, one generation holds it, the mm. third loses it. Well, he quadrupled it. <laughs> yeah. Wow, yeah. that's amazing. Well, yeah. thank you for that. Well, yeah. yeah, thank you. We'd love the referral. Hit him up on LinkedIn, obviously. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Friend requested on. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> but uh, thank you, you so much for your time, mate. I really appreciate it. And again, um, for everyone listening, we're going to have the show notes so they can contact you. But mate, really appreciate it. Wish you nothing but success in the future and uh, we'll, we'll obviously stay in contact so thank you thanks guys it's been good thank you cheers. cheers thanks for listening to another episode if you enjoy listening to our podcast please feel free to hit us up on our social channels at Osmerican Aces if you're entertained inspired or feel more educated please share it with your friends and family because we appreciate the support righto catch you on the next one